So when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is free. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. Okay, that means that you can open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 19 today as we are continuing our study in the book of Luke. Book of Luke, book of Acts. Well, this is the book of Luke part two. Okay, book of Acts. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we're seeing Paul's time in Ephesus or his, as he starts, he's just approaching Ephesus is where we left him last week. We saw that Apollos had been teaching in Ephesus. He was a uh, a brother who had come and was uh, strong in the word, strong in the scriptures, but didn't uh, have anything but the baptism of John in his theological vocabulary. And so they uh, were, Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, Paul's co-workers, were able to help them. Paul was over in the Jerusalem area and in the Antioch area for a season. And Apollos was taught by Aquila and Priscilla and then began to teach in Ephesus. And finally, he ends up going to Corinth. And as Paul is on his way back on what we call his third missionary journey, he was going through Asia Minor, and he was visiting the cities that he had already had congregations planted in. And he was on his way to Ephesus, but he had not get, gotten there yet last week. Last week, we just saw that God was building the team so that the Apostle Paul would be able to have all sorts of things happen. By the way, Paul planted congregations in Pisidian Antioch, um, in Iconium, in Lystra, in Derby, But there were all sorts of congregations throughout Asia Minor. And there were the seven churches which are listed in Revelation. There were other churches um, that were uh, Laodicea. I mean, of course, that was one of the seven. But there were other churches which were... Uh, planted by his co-workers, his team, during that time that he was in Ephesus. And you'll see why those churches were able to be planted today um, when we see that Paul does arrive in Ephesus. He spends three years in Ephesus. We thought it was a big deal that he was able to spend two years in Corinth. But in Corinth is where Christianity was legitimized by the proconsul Gallio. And so he could stay longer in locations. Also, the synagogue in Ephesus um, allowed him to speak for a longer period of time without rejecting him. And even when they rejected him, it was basically, it sounds like a few of the members would get up and begin to oppose what he was speaking about. And so he withdraws from that synagogue simply because he's going to keep the peace and the synagogue rulers want to keep the peace and they're not going to fight each other because they recognize I mean Paul especially what he owes to the Jewish people he was Jewish himself and so he separates from the synagogue but there there doesn't appear to be a great deal of rancor just disagreement and some of the members you know began to step into a place that wasn't healthy and so Paul steps away all this stuff we're going to see today, and we're going to see the impact or the result of Paul being able to teach in Ephesus. And today, um, we are looking at Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. At 19 it is, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 12. And I've simply entitled today's message, The Spirit Flexes His Power. And it shows up every, everywhere we look in this particular section of Scripture. And next week, we'll be seeing the power that the Holy Spirit is releasing all through what was going on in and around Ephesus as Paul had a chance to be able to minister in peace in this absolutely Gentile area and see what God was doing as they were doing as he, you know as they were going forward and building the kingdom so we're going to start with Acts chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 a reminder this is my translation of Acts chapter 19 I might have said 9 again uh, but it's Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. And that is, it's my translation of the Greek text. And so it's always good if you have your own Bible open in front of you or an electronic device with your favorite version of the Bible open in front of you. Of course, if your favorite version is my translation, well, just God bless you. Anyway. 
Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior highlands and arrived in Ephesus. He found some disciples there and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They responded to him, Not at all. We have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So, so we've got that set up, the first two verses. Paul was in the middle area of what we today call Turkey, Asia Minor. And he had been visit, visiting this, the uh, cities where he had already planted churches in that middle area. And as he is on his way, Apollos takes off to Corinth. And then Paul continues to travel there. So Paul heads there. Paul arrives and Apollos is gone. Uh, it says uh, he went through the, the uh, middle or interior highlands. And some of your translations, they don't usually mention the word highlands, uh, although the word does mean highlands. And if you know the geography of Asia Minor right there, you understand why translating it highlands is probably a good translation. Um, you can see from this uh, geographical depiction of Asia Minor, all those darker brown areas, of course, are mountainous regions. And to get through the interior, and you can see the road through the interior, you go through the mountains, you go through the highlands, and that's the route he took to be able to get to Ephesus, which you can see right on the coast. And so Paul went through the interior road, through the highlands, and he got down to Ephesus. And then he um, ran into a group of people who were disciples. Now, it's interesting it calls them disciples because we find out something about them that makes us wonder, how can they be disciples if they don't even know the baptism of Jesus or the Holy Spirit? I mean, that's two very big doctrinal issues. If you were trying to connect with a Christian congregation today and saying, ah, let's show up in a service and see how it's going and find out that they don't have baptism in the name of Jesus. All they have is a baptism of repentance, which means you would come in and they'd say, hey, do you repent of your sins? Yes. OK, we can get you into the baptismal. And that's what they baptize. You'd say, wait a minute, there's something missing here. Isn't there supposed to be something in the name of Jesus and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit or something like that happening when I get baptized? Isn't this supposed to connect me to Jesus? And so that, that wouldn't be there. And then you'd say, well, okay, that's, I, okay, maybe I can get through that. But all of a sudden you find out that it's Father and Son. There's no Holy Spirit. And you think, okay, now I'm a bit disturbed. Which means they... This particular group of disciples simply had, uh, along the way, they've got, they were disciples because they were following the Lord as far as they knew. It means that they had gotten saved. Maybe Apollos preached to them, but Apollos, um, at some point, got enough information that he didn't have to be rebaptized because it's obvious they didn't do that. And he was already spirit filled by the time he ran into the Paul, uh, to Paul, well, actually, Aquila and Priscilla. And they, they taught him more adequately everything that was going on. Uh, but then again, he could, have, he could have been the one who preached to them before he actually learned about the Holy Spirit and before he learned those other things. So. Um, but for any reason, these guys were disciples. They were really following God, but they didn't have the full picture. And so that's why they can be called disciples. I once had a friend in college, and we were talking about when Jesus died on the cross and the resurrection from the dead and the gradual changing of epochs, right? And his theology was, and it was, you know, remember we were coming from a particular denomination, and their theology um, was... You know, focused in a particular direction. However, his theology was simply this. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again, the old covenant was canceled and you had to believe in Jesus instantly. Now, it's pretty clear there are still two covenants today and you can choose which one you want to be under because the Apostle Paul says to the Galatians, you guys, now that you have come under the new covenant 
and receive the Holy Spirit, why would you fall from grace? If you, if you come under that old covenant by requiring yourself to be, or allowing yourself to be circumcised because you think it's appropriate, if that happens, you know, that you think in order to be accepted by God, I got to receive circumcision, or I can't eat pork, or I can't do any of these things that the old covenant, that we call the old covenant, says, you, you are coming under the old covenant. It is now your covenant, which means you do not live under grace. And in order to get the blessings that Jesus won for us, you now have to keep the 613 commands of the Old Covenant. Okay, so anyway, this particular gentleman didn't understand anything about the fact that there are, ba there are two covenants. And so he simply said, hey... At the point that Jesus rose again from the dead, everyone who had not heard of Jesus had to receive him before they died, or they couldn't be saved. I think even today that would be a challenge. How long would it take you to get the news out? I mean, what he was saying is that if you were one of God's people and suddenly Jesus rose again from the dead, you suddenly weren't one of God's people. And that means you were in big trouble. And God, God doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. That's an insecure theology. And God works with people. And he works with their imperfect understandings. When Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, called these guys that did not have the baptism of Jesus and did not have the Holy Spirit, today we'd call them sectarian. we call them a sect. We'd say they're not really a Christian group, but, you know, they, they may know Jesus, but they're not really a Christian group. That's just how theologians divide things. And yet, Luke calls them disciples. And for whatever reason, as Paul runs into these guys, um, he asks them, you know, have you, did you receive the Holy Spirit? It might be that it was a discussion going on, and he realized there's just some stuff that they don't understand yet, I think. And so I'm going to ask, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they respond, which, you know, they, they had Jesus. They didn't have the baptism of Jesus, but they had Jesus. Why? Because they had John's baptism, and John was the one pointing to Jesus. He's the Messiah. So they had Jesus. But they didn't have this full understanding. And so Paul asked that simple question. And their response was, uh, no. In fact, it was a strong no. It wasn't just, um, you know, it wasn't just, hey, uh, we don't think so. It was a strong no that simply said no. It, by no means, basically. It was on the contrary. It, it was one of the strongest ways that you could state a negative. Like, what are you talking about? We don't even know what that is. And so um, they didn't understand even that there was a Holy Spirit. And so the Apostle Paul, speaking to this particular group of disciples, people that had a relationship with God but a faulty understanding about him, Paul continues asking some uh, more pointed questions. Paul asks, this is verses 3 and 4, So into what were you baptized? They said, into the baptism of John. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people that they should believe in the one coming after him. This one is Jesus. Now, the first thing I want you to understand, and a lot of times your translations get rid of it, but it's very clear that the Apostle Paul is saying into, into, into. We are baptized into something. The, uh, there is a Greek word for in, and there's a Greek word for into. And sometimes they're used interchangeably, but this one is very clearly into. It's not baptized in the name of Jesus. It's baptized into the name of Jesus. And that is a clear way that baptism is talked about in the New Testament. You are baptized into something. And so Paul says baptism is into something. So into what were you baptized? Feels like a little bit of an awkward phrasing, but it's actually asking the question of the moment. Into what were you baptized? And they said, into the baptism of John. They used his same language. They all understand you were baptized into something. And the Apostle Paul says, hey, you know, okay. 
Um, by the way, just letting you know and, uh, about that into thing, Paul says in Romans 6, 3 about water baptism for Christians, are you ignorant that all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were baptized into Christ Jesus. If we're Christians, we get baptized. We get water baptized. If you haven't been water baptized as a Christian, it means you got something hanging out there yet that needs to be taken care of. Our baptistry used to be behind a divider. Now it's just behind Fenland's artwork and a bunch of other stuff. But we can wheel that thing out in a moment's notice. We can't fill it in a moment's notice, but we can get it, you know, <laughs> by the next service. Um, but so anyway, you're baptized into Jesus Christ and he says by the way don't you know that means you've been baptized into his death which is why you have forgiveness because you've died to sin he died on the cross dying to all sin and that's now you dying to all sin and that's why sin no longer is your master he goes on to say so you've been baptized when you were baptized into Jesus Christ you were baptized into his death and it makes all the difference in our sanctification now, speaking of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For we also were baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free people, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Okay, so when we are baptized by the Holy Spirit, when his power came, we are baptized into the body of Christ. Why is it into the body of Christ? Because the body of Christ is all God's people. And in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul makes it very clear that the body of Christ is about function. It's when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are given a function. You are given a role to play in the body. Paul talks, you know, that illustration about the hand or the eye. You know, if you are, if you, know, if you don't want to be the eye that God has made you to be, it's the body's going to be walking around and stumbling over a lot of things. Um, if you, you know, it, it, it's, it's a picture of the role or the function that God has given you. So when we were baptized by the Holy Spirit, we were given, we were baptized into the body. We're always baptized into something. So, and he says John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. You were baptized into repentance, into an agreement with God that his way is the right way and your way is the wrong way, but that's not into Jesus Christ or into his death. When John came on the scene, he was always looking to another, which was Jesus. And so they, he taught them, and they received it, and they recognized what was going on. Um, and it says, well, by the way, there were, we're in verses 5 to 7. When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. After Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in languages and to prophesy. There were about 12 men. So they heard Paul say, hey, you've been baptized into John's baptism. That was just a precursor. And now you need to be baptized into the name of Jesus. They all said, sure, let's do it. And they got baptized. And after they were baptized, they came out of the water, and the Apostle Paul then laid hands on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized into the Holy Spirit, and so baptized into the body of Christ. So they were baptized into the name of Jesus. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit, and all sorts of things changed in their life. They suddenly had much better understanding and insight, and the Holy Spirit's power came on them. They hadn't even known there was a Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit came on them, and it was evidenced by speaking in languages. And By the way, it doesn't say what kind of languages. Remember, the gift of languages, like every one of the gifts in the, in the Bible, shows up in a lot of different ways. Someone can have the gift of languages, and it means that they simply are very facile with languages so that they can learn, you know, seven, eight languages. I mean, that's a gift. But they learn it the normal way. Sometimes, and you hear stories about missionaries going out into cultures and suddenly having the ability to communicate in an emergency situation. One of the uh, missionaries that we know over in another land showed up without any formal language, formal language changing and cha uh, uh, any formal language training and was able to pick up the language in an extremely short period of time. 
That's, that's the gift of languages. That's, it's an amazing thing. He was able to preach. If you can preach in someone else's language, you've got the language down. That's amazing. Okay, so, I mean, I remember once years ago, I, was, I called uh, one of the well-known language immersive courses, and I said, okay, I, want, I, I have this particular target group that I'd really like to be able to communicate to. And I said, how long would it take for me to get facile in the language? And they, were, they gave me a number. And then they said, I said, oh, so how long would it take for me to be able to preach in that language? And they just kind of rocked back on their heels and went, well, that's a whole different story. So when someone's able to go and on his own, as he's working with the people, suddenly pick up the language, you know there's a gift being employed. The Holy Spirit's doing something. By the way, this shouldn't bother you. I, I don't know virtually of any teachers who did not have to learn their craft even though they have the gift of teaching. I know virtually no preachers that didn't have to learn their craft, even though they have the gift of preaching. I mean, so I, there's, you know, we have this, there's this thing in the body of Christ that happens that certain gifts can't be practiced. They just got to happen, which makes it different than every other gift. Gift of encouragement. That's a spiritual gift. And yet, sometimes when you exercise it for the first time, you show up and you, like, you, you say, I'm going I'm to, I want to encourage this person, and you stumble over your words, and you're wondering if you just released the gift of discouragement rather than encouragement. Because you learn what helps people. And that gift is anointed, and it's learned, and it's helped with. The Apostle Paul says, you know, the gifts that were given you to Timothy by the laying on of hands, Fan them into flames. Exercise them. Get them to the place that they need to be. Supernatural gifts show up all the time where we need to develop them. That's what Paul said to Timothy. It's the way it works, obviously, with teaching. It's the way it obviously works with so many of the other gifts. And it works with whatever happened here. Whatever this language was, it may have been exalting God in a, a, a language that they had never known, which is what I suspect it was. Because prophecy came on them. And prophecy was, you know, remember what happens when, the, when uh, excuse me, Saul the king prophesied? He'd be walking along and run into the presence of Samuel, and all of a sudden he'd fall down on the ground, he'd be prophesying, and it, it, became so, it happened so often, honestly, they said, is Saul also among the prophets? Now, he was absolutely taken over by the Holy Spirit. Remember, in the Old Covenant, the only people that got the Holy Spirit were the prophets, priests, and kings. The New Covenant is we all have the opportunity to get the Holy Spirit. That's the New Covenant. Old Covenant, prophets, priests, and kings. New Covenant, the body. And so it's a, a, that was the major shift of epochs. So um, they were evidencing the Holy Spirit, and uh, they were obviously, gloriously fulfilled in their knowledge of Christ. And then they, this weird statement, it's just a weird statement, there were about 12 men. And you think to yourself, uh, Luke, what does that mean? You know, there were about 12 men. Well, what that means in that culture, by the way, it says 12 males. Not, not, it's not the generic word for, for man or mankind. It's 12 males. And what this is saying is Luke would go out of his way to say something like this. And he says about 12. He doesn't even say 12. He says there were about 12 because they came with their families. This is, a, this is a, quite a large group if you think about it. 12 heads of families and all of them arrayed under them. This, wasn't, this, was, a, this was probably a new church that formed right then. And the Apostle Paul got them moving in the right direction by simply saying, um, do you know about the Holy Spirit? And they said, no, I haven't a clue what you're talking about. So, big start in Ephesus already. Gets there and runs into these guys and has major impact. A home group started, a large home group. You know, 12 people times five or six family members and servants, more than that. And you suddenly have, you have a pretty significant sized group. So, then Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly for about three months. He dialogued with them and worked to persuade them about the kingdom of God. So, Paul uh, 
He initially spent his time in the synagogue. Generally speaking, when you were a tradesman, what you would do is get up before sunrise and you would work till 11, and then from 11 to 4, you'd have off, and then you'd come back and do more work in the evening for obvious reasons. It was warm in the afternoons, and so people would take care of, you know, they, they'd have a rest time in the afternoon. And so uh, Paul on the Sabbath, of course, would be speaking at the synagogue, but then probably during the week also had that in-between time. Synagogues were not a place that uh, was empty during the week. There would always be some kind of teaching or training or talk or discussion going on. And so the Apostle Paul would have an opportunity to speak there. And it says he spoke there for about three months. That's a lot of favor. He had that that's a huge amount of favor. And he would dialogue and persuade people about the kingdom of God. That's interesting. Luke says he was dialoguing. That means that's a back and forth. Okay? There was dialogue happening, back and forth. And he was attempting to persuade them about the kingdom of God. And, of course, if there's a kingdom, then there's a king. And king was Jesus, the Messiah. And so he's trying to help them understand that the Messiah has come and the kingdom of God has been initiated. And all of the teachings that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God in the, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of them were... You know, you, as he was sharing, I'm surprised he was able to get anything done in three months because that's a lot of information that he's trying to get into them all at once and help them understand what the kingdom is all about. And at a certain point, it just didn't work anymore. But when some of them began to become hardened and disobedient and began slandering the way in front of the congregation, Paul withdrew from them and took his disciples away. He began speaking each day in the school of Tyrannus. Okay, so we know that Paul, there was the tension developing, and, and it says some of them became hardened, and some of them became disobedient. Not the whole synagogue by any stretch, but if you're having a dialogue in front of people, and all of a sudden there's this, hardened group, really adamantly against you group, that gets up and comes against you every time, not just theologically, but begin to insinuate slanders. You guys are just doing this because you want power. You are just doing this for your own baba, whatever, okay? At a certain point, you say this is no longer beneficial because your people that want to learn are no longer learning. They're getting angry about the other stuff happening. And then, of course, the people that's, that haven't received your message but are not among the disobedient, as they are called, um, they, that's, they want their synagogue to be a peaceful place. And so uh, it became something that Paul realized needed to take place where he needed to separate from them. And uh, obviously, because they were hardened, because they were uh, disobedient, well, then the fruit's going to be negative, too, and the fruit was slander. By their fruit, you will know them. And that's always, quite, by their fruit, you will know them. And uh, I was having a discussion with someone just the other day, and we were talking about an individual that I have not seen any Christian fruit from, but they call themselves a Christian. But, I mean... The, the, the awful things this person does. I mean, awful. I could give you a litany or a list, but I'm not going to. It's just awful. I don't, there's no love your neighbor as yourself. There's no uh, grace. There's no, it's, it's, it's mean, vile, nasty, manipulative, control-oriented stuff all the time. And I just looked at the person. I says, I, at a certain point, have to say by their fruit, I have to know them. I have to examine them. And I believe at this particular point in time that the person is not and has never been a Christian. Now, that's a harsh statement. But do you, do you take Jesus' words seriously or don't you? If the, the person is a um, mean, nasty, disobedient, hardened individual um, who has never evidenced the grace of God in their life, when... At what point do you simply say, when do I apply Jesus' words? By their fruit, you will know them. And I think that at a certain point, after a 20-year history, if you aren't making that determination, you are probably being a bit too timid about the discernment that we're supposed to exercise. Now, um, I've, by the way... I've probably said that about three people in my life. Because I don't rush to judgment. I'm always looking for the Lord. But at a certain point, you just simply got to say, this person does not qualify 
They can say they're a Christian, but they just don't qualify in any manner. So the, the fruit of these guys were slander. And so the Apostle Paul just simply said, okay, let's go, and they withdrew to a rented hall. And that's what the, the school of Tyrannus, a lot of your translations call it the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Uh, the Greek word is skole, from which we get our word school. Okay. It's a school. It was a place which was used by a guy named Tyrannus, we think so. Uh, might have been his nickname because the word simply means tyrant. But you've all had school teachers like that. So I, usually, I shouldn't say school teachers, professors maybe, as we talk about when you move up the line a little bit. But um, So they moved into the school of Tyrannus, the school of the tyrant. I was tempted to, tam to translate it that way, but I thought, now nah, it's it really is a, a nickname or a, a given name. I can't imagine anybody naming their kid tyrant. So I, I think it was a nickname. They probably called him the tyrant because of his teaching methods or whatever, and it was a, a pet name given, you know, to him. And so that's what it was called, the school of the tyrant. And they started renting it, and they had a, a rented facility. And uh, Tyrannus probably did his teaching in the morning, during that early morning time till 11. And then Paul, when he was done with his work for the day by 11, was able to begin doing his teaching from 11 to 4 every day. And he was able to continue going. So he had a great deal of opportunity. And how long did it go on? Verse 10. They continued for two years with the result that all of those who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. He had that two fruitful years. Now, I, I just simply, when you think about it, Paul was a rabbinic scholar. He grew up under Gamaliel. That means that he was able to develop a syllabus, that he was able to develop a teaching program that he was able to disciple people in for a couple of years. There's a bit of me, when you hear this, you go, wow. You know, it, it, tinged with envy because the people that were able to sit at a fully trained rabbinic scholar's feet, Paul, and learn about the kingdom of God and Jesus. One of the reasons his letters can be so eloquent and so doctrinally inclusive is he honed the messages in this hall, this school, as he taught day after day, week after week for two years. And those messages certainly became part of the things that he wrote in his letters. This would have been an incredible time, an extremely fruitful time. And it was extremely fruitful. The result was all Asia heard. Now, remember, their Asia and what we call Asia today, different places. Asia's right there at the west end of Asia Minor. That's Asia, the Asia that is being discussed. And that's where the congregations were started, the seven congregations um, of uh, Revelation and, and then you know some of the others. So uh, that whole area of Asia was reached. Churches were planted as people w went out from the school of Tyrannus, having heard Paul, and went out and planted different churches. So the Holy Spirit was certainly flexing his power. I mean, good night. The, the Apostle Paul runs into a group of 12 and finds out that they simply don't have a full understanding of the gospel, and instantly they're filled with the power of God, and a whole home group is formed, a, a church is formed, you know, a, a congregation in and of itself. And uh, by the way, what's a minion? 12, yeah, okay. That's probably why Luke mentioned the 12, don't you think? There was a minion of the 12 males. Uh, that's why you need to start a synagogue, a minion. So the uh, um, Holy Spirit flexed his power, and they suddenly had a whole congregation going, a Christian synagogue, if you will. And then the Holy Spirit flexed his power again. The Apostle Paul got to teach, and all of Asia hears the message, and churches are planted all over the place. And just so that we understand just how much the Holy Spirit was flexing his power, 
Luke adds this in 19, 11, and 12. God performed miracles through the hands of Paul of a type not normally experienced. Towels and aprons that had touched his skin were even carried away and placed upon the sick. And they were freed from their disease, and the evil spirits left them. Wow, that's incredible. Now, there's a couple of things when you look at this. You go, um, God did the miracles through Paul. Obviously, God does the miracles. We pray, we lay on hands, we do the different things that God has called us to do. And then God's, it, the miracles are up to him. We're just doing what he faithfully told us to do, to be a conduit. And Paul was certainly a conduit. Um, unusual miracles. I want you to think about that phrase. Uh, miracles of a sort that weren't normally experienced. Think about that. Okay, unusual Miracles, not the normal miracle. You know that's what Luke's saying, right? It's of the sort that, and that, by the way, that's very literal, that people normally didn't experience, not normally experienced by people. So there are the normal miracles. What are the normal miracles? Well, you lay hands on people and they're healed. You do whatever. I mean, there's, you know... There's normal miracles, but these are unusual miracles. Now, Jesus did some unusual miracles. He's walking down the road. Someone grabs the hem of his garment, and they're healed. That's an unusual miracle. Peter walking down the road, and it says his shadow touched people, and they had faith to be healed from that. And, of course, there is some discussion about whether that was a manifestation of the glory of God in his life or whether it was a real shadow, because it could be either word. But God did unusual, not normally experienced miracles. What were they? Well, cloth, cloth items that touched him carried power. Now, I know a lot of translations say handkerchiefs and, you know, whatever. Um, the word is basically, the, the first word is a sweat rag. They didn't have pockets. You know, they didn't, they didn't, I mean, you'd put a towel over your over your shoulder because you'd need to wipe your brow. They didn't have air conditioning in their pockets, and so you had, you had a towel that you carried along with you, a, a rag to be able to wipe your brow. This summer I, I was going out a lot and knocking on doors, or at least doing door hangers, and I made sure that I had a handkerchief with me because, boy, that sweat starts pouring into your eyes, that salt starts getting in there, and that's a pain. And, of course, when you're trying to, to look like a candidate... Wearing a sweatband is not an option. So, but that's what they had. They had their, their uh, towels that they would have with them, and then he'd have his workman's apron, and that's, that's really what it is, towels and aprons. That's the, the, the stuff. It's just two of the examples which Luke mentions, towels and aprons. And it says uh, that had touched his skin. Now, and, and, I mean, it literally says it touched his skin. Now, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I instantly go back to the story of Elisha. Remember the, the story of the, the, the Elisha and the woman and her husband that prepared a room for him on their roof because they knew he was a man of God. And she says to her husband, let's prepare a room and put a bed in it. And every time he comes, he can stay with us. We can feed him. And so he began to stay there. And at one point in time, Elisha says to the, his servant, because it wasn't appropriate to talk directly to the woman in that culture, he says to his servant, you know, at least for a man of God, and at that, in, like I said, in that culture. And so he, he uh, says to his servant, what can we do for this woman? And she's standing right there. And she just says, well, I have a home among my people. It doesn't matter. I don't, need, I don't need any special benefit. I'm doing this for you. And the servant says, she does not have a child. She does not have a son. And Elisha looks at her and says, this time next year you'll have a child. And so, and she does. She has a child, a son. And it wasn't long after that. I mean, the child appears to be like a, a toddler yet who could still talk. He ran out to his father in the field grabbing his head, saying, my head, my head. He says to the workers, take him to his mother, because they're in the midst of the harvest, and they take him to the mother, and it says that she sits him, uh, holds him in her lap, and he dies. And so she saddles her donkey, hides this from everyone, puts him on Elisha's bed in his room, and goes and finds him, knows where he'll be. 
And Elisha sends his servant and says, take, your, take my staff and lay it on him. And she says, I'm not leaving until you come. So he starts going with her, uh, gets there, finds out that nothing has happened. The boy has not uh, revived. And so he puts everyone out of the room and he lays on the boy. Mouth to mouth, hands to hands, arms to arms. Contact. So there's something, in my opinion, based upon stories such as that, and the laying on of hands to begin with, where the power of God can be communicated through touch. And Paul was so filled with the power of God, as Jesus was, that when someone grabbed his garment, even the clothing that he was wearing were saturated with the power of God. There's something where there was this unusual miracle which occurred and so they took these cloths out and by the way they weren't you know they weren't prayer cloths that were prayed over in a meeting you know that that happens a lot and you know where people pray over prayer cloths in a meeting and um i'm i'm not even saying that's wrong by any stretch why would i say that i mean that's just people exercising their faith but that wasn't what they were doing that's what happens today because of reading this scripture but what they did is, you know, Paul would be working and he would wipe his brow and he'd put it down and some believer would come up and say, hey, I got a sick relative. Can I take that? And I, I think they'd ask. One never knows about these things. And they would take them and there would be deliverance. There'd be freedom. That's amazing. It says the, the sick and the torment, tormented were healed. Now, um, many, many years ago, many, it's so long ago, I looked the dream up, and it's not in my computer. And I've been tracking dreams on my computer since dinosaurs roamed the earth. We're talking... This, this dream was probably before 2000, somewhere in the mid-90s. I had a dream, and it was really exciting because I was told that God was going to release Luke 43.11. And I woke up from that dream. I was so excited. I was like, wow, this is the greatest thing. And I went and I grabbed my Bible. It was still the nighttime, but I grabbed my Bible and I opened it up and I realized, wait a minute. Luke only has 24 chapters. And I sat there for a minute. I'm thinking, well, well that was a weird dream. And then I suddenly realized, oh no, Luke doesn't have just 24 chapters. Because Luke wrote a whole nother book. And this is Luke 43.11. And it's the first time that I've been able to preach it, having preached through the whole book. And I believe there's a timing thing. And I am really excited as we have moved into our new building that the Holy Spirit has the ability to flex his power when he wants to. This is like a 20-year word, more than that. And I, I said, you know, I, I heard Dawn mention that today. You know, we're going to pray over our cards and we're going to do this because of what Paul did. And I'm like, yeah, we are. Because, you know, you just got to give God the room to do stuff. And that's so cool. Let's pray. I'm... I, I recognize time frames, and I think this is one of those times. Lord, I am thanking you that 20-some years ago, you spoke to me in a dream about Luke 43, 11, Acts 19, 11. And I ask that on this day that we would see your power return to your church 
not just here. We're not just asking for here. We're asking throughout the world. We're asking throughout our nation, throughout our state, throughout our county, throughout our city. We are asking that all those who are victims of sickness and disease and all of the negative, awful things that can happen in this life would begin to see the maladies, the illnesses, the torments reversed as you flex your power. We are asking that healing would be obvious once again. Like it was in Paul's day. Like it has happened and manifested itself through revivals throughout history. We are asking that this day would be that day. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.